next, we are going to move to, uh, we want to invite Deputy Superintendent Patty Norman and to come to the table and any staff or. Linda, uh, board members Hanson and Warner will respond. Which one am I on? Yeah, I'm on U oh. UETN is after that. I was, I jumped ahead. Okay. So we're on number 13. Deputy Superintendent Patty Norman. Yes. Pre All right. Thank you. you um, Deputy Superintendent Patty Norman, I just wanted to start out by saying that I serve as a public a representative for public education on the UETN board and with that there's four members that are representing public education the Utah State Board of Education is one of them in September of 2016 this board um, appointed me to represent USBE at the meetings and be a voting member and I want to kind of go over a timeline as to um, an EPS, EP, the EBSCO issue and what's arisen and then I also want to let the board know that right behind me I have our UETN rate Dr. Ray Timothy and Dr. Laura Hunter if there's more in-depth questions they are here to provide any of those clarifications or questions that any of you might have I also while I'm um, talking this through want you to be aware of the documents that are on board docs so if you go to this item number there were some things that are added and there's some things in there that aren't for the public um, for example, if you see in your executive comments or content, there is the contract that some of you were looking for. And so that contract is in there. There's also some, um, sorry, my computer shut off, so let me get in there really quick. So the letter from EBSCO explaining what happened and what occurred. And again, there's a follow-up with this, the um, second item in there, the Utah Education Network statement, is giving some more clarification about what they do and what it looks like. The third is the statement from Gale, which is one of an, a database, and then also from World Book Online, another database. Then the last one, um, this was also at the UETN meeting, and that's a summary of public comment at, um, that they showed at the UETN meeting. Then the UETN motion that was passed, as well as um, the USBE. EBSCO LEA responses and that's something that our office did within the last 36 hours of gathering feedback from LEAs and I can say our office but I'll say that Sarah really was able to get that all together Sarah Young was able to get that together and have an analysis of those responses here so um, what I'm hoping is that you're not going to be looking at all of those things yet while I'm saying what um, the, the background but when we can when we're going to those things then I can refer to those documents and you know what's in there did I do the bad teacher thing and showed you what was there and now you're gonna <laughs> okay just because I <laughs> okay all right yes okay and um, so data EBSCO one of the questions that was asked is what is EBSCO and so it's a database aggregator with full text journal articles used for research so in Utah EBSCO is licensed for use by academic libraries public libraries and k-12 schools EBSCO was selected through competitive RFP and has been licensed for over 10 years. If you look, if you want to look at that contract now as I'm talking to this point, that contract shows that it was uh, renewed in July of 2018 and it goes till June of 2019. So in there, that's what the contract that we're talking about is right in there right now. Next, on Thursday, September 20th, Senator Weiler, and I have to also say that Senator Weiler, and correct me if I'm wrong, is a UETN on the advisory committee is that correct so senator Weiler is on the UETN advisory committee which is probably maybe one of the reasons why he was notified um, he received an email from one of his constituents regarding an article that was found in the EBSCO database part of Utah's online library so describing content that this um, con constituent seemed um, inappropriate for Utah students senator Weiler subsequently emailed the message to multiple constituents including dr. Ray Timothy the message was forwarded to UETN staff that evening then staff immediately submitted a support ticket and contacted contacted EBSCO directly then worked with EBSCO to identify the journals and specific article staff requested that the article be removed from the k-12 instance of EBSCO then on Saturday 
that they learned that the issue, issue could be resolved by looking just at the K-12 databases, leaving academic and public library services unchanged. And after consulting with several board members, and that's the UETN board members, staff disabled the links to EBSCO K-12 products, meaning elementary, middle, and high school, and notified constituents via several mailing lists and an article on the UEN homepage. Then the following week, so throughout the week of September 24th, and October 1st through that week, UETN staff held multiple calls with EBSCO to resolve the issue and gain assurances that only school and age-appropriate material will be available on the K-12 databases. Then, as part of that agreement, EBSCO implemented more robust filtering on key terms, blocked journals that are marketed to adults and typically not appropriate for K-12 and other measures. So that's the, the statement that you'll see in there. That's the EBSCO statement that tells them about blocking those journals. The new measures have been and continue to be tested by EBSCO and UETN staff. Though no solution can provide 100% assurance, the additional measures are, seem to be working and providing a more robust filtering solution for K-12. Then UETN also contacted the other database providers, Worldbook Online and Gale Cengage. One of the reasons why that is a part of the background information on this is you'll see that um, some of the documentation that's up there is uh, teachers, librarians, and parents are referring to using Worldbook or using Cengage in, in different ways. So they are a, as part of the data as a part of the database. Um, then existing UETN board policy provided guidance for handling this issue. So there is policy regarding this issue and how to handle complaints like this, and those were followed. Additionally, board member Eggett, so Colleen Eggett, or I'm not sure how many of you know her, she's a, um, a board member. And one of the things that she said that in addition to these filters that um, that could be take it, that could take place is to reopen um, the Utah Online Library Committee, previously known as the Pioneer Library Committee, comprised of leaders from academic, public, and K-12 libraries, along with UETN, to provide additional recommendations to UETN for challenges of this nature and for library services overall. When we were at the UETN meeting, there were several parents that were there, and one of the things that they requested. And, or we heard from our, um, odd, our um, the group that was there, is if parents could also be on that committee. And that is something that UETN can decide and um, have whatever members are appropriate be on that committee. So that's a decision that could be made. Then on October 1st, a UETN board meeting was held, public comment was heard, and the following motion was voted on. And this is the motion that you see also in there. So a motion was made by Ben Dalton, who is a superintendent, and seconded by Steve Hess to leave EBSCO K-12 system off and not available until further research can be done to assure the students are safe in this type of environment and also to research current tools that are out there to make sure we don't have this issue in those other products that we have discussed. An amendment was made to continue to test the EBSCO system in the K-12 settings. And I think it's important at this time to be able to say what is that additional research that was requested to be done. So with that, there's additional follow-up questions that they want answered. Some of it is, um, is EBSCO marketing in appropriate materials to children? Are there other sources for research? Uh, whose decision is it that, that uh, this really has to continue the subscription? Who's going to be providing the oversight? Those are the types of questions that are in there right now that are being researched before the October 15th? 19th. Thank you, the October 19th meeting. Um, so at this point, that's the background of where we're at right now. And I don't know if you'd like to have um, Dr. Hunter and um, Dr. Timothy come up so they could answer questions as well. Before we go there, there's expectations. You represent us. Yes. Um, and there's, what are your expectations going into this um, October 9th, is it October 19th? October 19th. Meeting. So the your expectation, expectation today is something. Yes, thank you. The expectation today is when I um, was at the board meeting on October 1st, we had uh, we have a multitude of uh, perspectives and ideas here within the board. I did not feel that I could adequately represent the voice of the board when we have a board that still needed to discuss something of this magnitude. So at that time, I abstained from the vote. The vote was six to one in favor of the motion. So one, six, um, four, one against, and then I abstained from the vote. It is a 13-member committee, and they do a simple majority vote having to have seven members there to have a quorum. So the other expectation is I'm not going to be there on the October 19th meeting. Um, and so there's a second expectation that in order for us to have a vote, that um, this board would uh, possibly uh, have Superintendent Dixon. 
go in my place, but that would, yeah, to temporarily be the voting member of that committee on the 19th. Okay. Yeah, the, if, if a motion is made, we, we need at least that motion um, to be made to, because um, Patty won't be able to attend that, that meeting. So um, before we invite, invite people up, or maybe we, sh maybe we should invite, because I think we're going to get into a little bit of board, dis board discussion, is um, you're basically whoever represents us will represent probably a concern or a voice in this, in this meeting, and then also is one of, of just, is just one vote right. uh, on uh, any proposed action that will happen that day. So, and yes. one of the things is there is higher education, we, so it's Utah ed, um, Education and Telehealth Network. So there's a health industry, <clears throat> there's higher education, um, <clears throat> K-12 education. So when they're on there, they're really interested in what our board has to say today because they're feeling that this is in our arena. And so what we have to say is very important to the outcome of several other votes. So okay. I think you've done a really good job. Um, we of course we we know how to read and we've been tracking this a little bit and this support documents are are all here for us for our situational awareness or so hopefully we don't get redundant and dive back into uh, into this particular um, material to help inform the board however um, I, I do have a this is an operational question for you um, that I've been dying to ask I'll take the privilege to do this is Okay, they voted this to be turned off. So um, this is this is used all over the state. Um, what is Plan B for our schools and students? What what option do they have now on their for their um, information and data and research? And I hope you I hope it's not Google, but it might be. But what what is it? I'm curious where we move people now. And let me get one more document. I think it's relevant information because there's, there's. It seems like there's always unintended consequences on everything we we experience it as a board. I'm not sure if um, uh, the uh, UETN has experienced some of those consequences, but I'm curious what Plan B or the other options would be. So right now, one of the documents that's uploaded is the USBE LEA UETN um, feedback. And on that, this is what uh, Sarah Young put together. So there was a kind of a survey going out saying, what if we didn't have EBSCO, what would you use? How do your teachers use it? Um, do you use it as a full course or do you use it in response to having uh, it to be a standard to meet a standard? So there was re um, many responses received. Many is not a great qualifier, sorry about that. But then there was um, an analysis that was put together. And overarching, it says that, that our teachers are using this and one of the things that they're worried about, about not having it, is access to peer-reviewed articles. So um, in reading some of these, it's talking about the fact that they can go to Google or to, and there, there's an area, it's called Google Scholar, for those of you that uh, haven't used Google Scholar. And it does bring up scholarly articles. Um, and you can, you know, determine according to Lexile level, but not necessarily age level. There's some things that you can do there. But when we're talking about specific for students and for students to be able to understand it, they felt that EBSCO was something that they really relied on. Um, overall, they s our, our educators and our librarians are saying to us, if not S EBSCO, then what? And so they're, they're saying we need, we need this resource, this resource being how we use it and what's available to us and how we're using it in our classroom. So that, that's the part on here is if not EBSCO, then what? Because we need something to be able to fulfill this part of educating our students. Well, thank you. Um, you want to, should we invite uh, Dr. Timothy and Dr. Hunter to come up and, because I believe you might be answering a few questions or assisting in, in all this. And right now we're, um, is there any board comments or questions? I, I, board member Lear. Um, I did attend the meeting and I appreciated being able to do that even on short notice because I live within a stone's throw of the, of the meeting place so it was easy for, for me. But um, one of the questions I had right from the beginning, and it felt like that we were being, we were starting in the middle of this discussion, but I, I, w I wanted to understand the board's relationship to UETN. I don't know if the board 
has authority over UETN, if UETN is completely independent, if you're just asking to be pleasant and professional, I, I, I want to know if the board, what, what authority the board has. Ray, who used to be my boss. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when you say the board, you mean the State, state board, board of Education. State Board of Education. I'm Ray, sorry, not the board of okay. UETN. Okay, Dr. Timothy, will you, so this people will recognize your voice with the name. Sure. So you don't have to do it every time you talk, but. All right, um, excuse me for that. Okay. Ray Timothy, I'm the CEO, Executive Director of UETN. Uh, UETN is a state entity. We were created by the legislature. We've been around since the, the mid-1950s. We started out as an educational television station. And as technology has evolved, we, we began to become the internet provider for school districts, for higher ed, for our applied technology colleges, for public libraries. Uh, that is our role. We're in a supportive role. Uh, the State Board of Education does not have oversight over us. It's a, it's a collaborative process. We, we look at our role as being a supportive role in helping you accomplish your mission. All of our stakeholders, uh, our goal is to help them uh, do what they do. And we provide, we're behind the scenes. That's why many of you don't know who we are. Uh, most of what we do is behind the scenes. And, uh, uh, but, but back to your original question, the State Board of Education does not have oversight. Our board has, has been legislatively created. Uh, there are appointed positions. Uh, they represent our stakeholders. And uh, they have oversight over UETN. Thank you. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Questions, comments? I'm making sure this works. Board, board member Reby. So I have used this tool throughout my whole entire career as a teacher. Um, I've used it with kindergartens all the way up to sixth graders. I used it when I was getting my master's degree and my admin degree. And I appreciate that this has been brought to our attention. My concerns are that, um, that we have a better process in place or that we um, make the process more robust. Uh, I appreciate that you have ratcheted up all these filters, um, but my concern with the process is now if we don't honor this code, Utah code, and keep this tool open, what's going to happen to the accreditation of schools in the rural areas? What's gonna happen to our rural schools? How are these schools going to be impacted if we do not have this kind of library available for all of our students? I'm the Chief Operating Officer of UETN. Um, I think your office would have better data on uh, which schools, smaller schools, rely on online library materials as part of their accreditation. Um, so the, this tool, the service used to be called the Pioneer Online Library, been around for more than 20 years. Um, and I know just from working with those schools that part of the way that they meet their accreditation requirements is by having the online library resources. Do you have a follow-up? No. You're good? Okay. Um, Vice Chair Ellis. Um, <clears throat> just a point of clarification, we're not required by code to have the Utah Online Library, yes, but not to have EBSCO, an EBSCO contract. Um, the Utah Online Library hasn't been shut down. There's still other resources available. If I'm wrong, correct me. I just That wasn't what I was commenting on. But, um, so in the contract, it doesn't have really any specifications um, and what we're paying for. I mean, we're paying for certain databases, but would it be possible to write a more robust contract with uh, EBSCO delineating exactly what we expect um, to have a safe environment for all children that are accessing it. Would, would that be a possibility? You could answer, yeah. Rebecca. Um, I just wanted to say that. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. That when we uploaded those, there were other attachment documents, and we felt those were the two that were most pertinent. There's actually more detail in another one that we could um, That's upload. That's what I'd like to see. Okay, and Scott, Deputy Jones. <laughs> yeah. So can you upload those other documents to the executive? Sure. Okay so that you can view those as well, because there is more detail in those, but we uploaded the two that we thought might be questions, so Scott can upload those as we're to the executive part. And I, um, sorry, I have a, a couple. 
Okay. But I can get back in line if you want. I just no. Let's. How many do you have total? I don't have. I mean, just a conversation. Um, I mean, okay, well, a couple. So okay. I've been looking. I yes. Sorry, I could also just further clarify that the databases are listed in groups. So there's things like Academic Search Premier, Explora, um, right. Novelist. There are different tools that are within that. Um, it seems to me I have been doing a little bit of researching at the college level through uh, BYU's contract with EBSCO, so outside of the government, um, and looking through the database for my through my daughter's uh, college login. And I found it interesting that um, while there was still some of this other content, the primary um, search results were academic in nature, and it's like the college had it set so that the what was coming up as the primary content was all primary source document, more academic in nature. And when I was searching before the K-12 portal got taken down, it didn't appear that it was academic in nature as the top search results um, in, on any given topic. And so that I, it seems like there could be some sort of filtering that would put academic stuff as a top priority if that's what this tool is meant to be used. So it's not really a statement, just a... Could you look into that more of a, th a thing? Sure. So the the BYU um, instance, they're part of the Utah Academic Library Consortium. Even though they're not a state institution, they are part of that consortium in Group I. So the instance that you were searching at the BYU library would be the same as in one of our public higher ed institutions. Okay. Same concept. So it would be the same type of thing. Mm -hmm. So I could check on the government. And then in site. terms of the results coming up, um, one of the filters that were put in place just this last week are were specific to the K-12 instance. Okay. Um, and I also, there's been a lot of talk about uh, filtering um, happening at the school level and where you're searching and different things like that. Um, I was on a, my child's school-issued laptop and was able to access all of it without any trigger to the district. And I wanted to point out that I have nephews and nieces in other states and I went to their high school to look at their online library and searched a, a similar term. Um, in Utah I got over 11,000 results and the first page was um, illicit in nature and not just academic in nature for this particular term. When I went to a high school in another state, the same high school, I mean it was a different database obviously, but no results were found and I just, you know, thought why can't we put a safe environment. My other request would be that we look at the law. I've asked our attorney um, to look at it. He's sick today and um, hasn't done a thorough analysis yet of it to make sure that we aren't putting um, things in front of minors that has no serious value because that's defined in code. And I found many things that under my non-legal interpretation um, conflict with the non-serious value. And so I would ask that that be closely examined by an attorney. And um, anyways, thank you. I'll let other people talk. Okay. Um, Board Member Gravett. Um, so I just wanted to ask, there, you know, there was a motion made on October 1st to um, shut the EBSCO system down and not be made available. The question I'm getting in as a teacher myself, will we not know when it can be back live again until the October 19th board meeting? Um, what's the status of that? Is it just not available for teachers and librarians and kids right now? Based upon the decision by our board, we, it is shut down until they, they gather back together again and make another motion. And that's October 19th? That's October 19th. And then just another question, which probably I know the answer to. There's no way you could just um, shut it down for certain, like grades 1 through 3, or but it just has to wait till October 19th. It, it's the K-12 instance that is shut okay. down at yeah, this point. Yeah, so the whole thing. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, Vice Chair Brittany Cummins. Uh, my question is similar on timeline uh, moving forward. So some of the questions that the board, your board asked um, at your last meeting were kind of dig in and get some research. Does that mean that your board has the intent to make a motion uh, on that, that information at the next meeting or is it just bring it back and we'll decide what to do next steps or is, do, is there the potential that those questions can be answered and problems resolved by that October 19th deadline? It's our intent that uh, we, our staff will be, be doing the research between now and then and that we'll be meeting with board leadership prior to that date 
and we will uh, have a, a recommendation for the board at that point. We're not expecting the board to at that point tell us then to go out and do the research. We will have already completed that. Board Member Reby. So part of this code is that we have to um, provide distance learning and we're trying to provide a consistent distant learning experience across the whole entire state. What tool could we use besides this? Because I've used Gale and that just seems like it's too, um, too young. And then um, I've used culture grams and encyclopedias and I don't really see the content that is as robust as EBSCO. So if we want to maintain a consistent, robust experience across the state, what other tool could we use and what else is out there if we are thinking of doing that? I could just respond with, in 2014, when we did the competitive RFP that selected uh, EBSCO, Gale, Worldbook, and the other library products that we have, the committee at that time felt that that was the best tool for the comprehensive databases category that we were scoring. Um, it's, I did hear a comment, uh, it is, it's the same contract that serves higher ed, public ed, and academic libraries but the use, the links are different for the different age groups. Um, we license Gale, and the, the biggest products that we license and uh, where Gale is used is a collection called Opposing Viewpoints. Opposing Viewpoints takes a, a current event issue and um, pre-packages uh, articles that are both on both sides of the issue. So it's helpful usually for beginning researchers that um, don't have to go do the searches. It's kind of pre-canned so that they analyze the, the text. Um, EBSCO is more of a broad database that requires researchers to go in and analyze the text themselves. Oh. Board Member Lair. And I, sorry if we're just, <clears throat> at least speaking for myself and kind of fact-finding, I'm kind of trying to understand because I don't, currently have the advantage of, of using this kind of a system and it sounds amazing. I would have loved to have had it 40 years ago as a teacher, but here we are. Um, my question is, and this maybe it's to Patty rather than the two of you, um, Superintendent Norman, De Deputy Superintendent Norman, it, it is feasible and maybe it's a leading question, but still, I, I, I'm, I'm curious. It is possible for individual parents in individual classrooms to say, I don't want my children to have access to just this database, all electronic resources that the school controls. How does, how does that work for individual parents? And Dr. Hunter can answer this a little bit more. So that is a part of what EBSCO offers, but um, UETN has done, done it a little bit different way. Do you want to speak? We, we have a statewide account, so we, we have kind of common denominator that um, our instance, anybody in any Utah school could click and get to EBSCO. It's not tied to individual user accounts. But to answer your question, I think that's true with anything in the schools. A, a parent could request services or not to have services, and, and that's something that your board um, deals with. So a parent, and just to make sure I understand and I get a complete answer so I'm not still processing this. So uh, an individual parent would, could say that, that, that she didn't want her student to have access to EBSCO or didn't, could it be that specific or could it be I don't want my student to have access to any online resources? What, what would it be, Patty, do you know? So in a school, a parent can make those decisions for their child. A parent can go in and say, and, and it doesn't even have to be with technology. It could be with a book or sure. a part of the curriculum, and something else will be put in its place that will help us same, achieve the same academic goal. So at any time, a parent has that right to be able to go in and make those decisions for their child, and then something the teacher will usually have an alternate educational experience for them to be using and right. attaining that same educational goal. But I don't think I was clear. Is that okay? I, I meant can the teacher... Could, it, could the parent make it so or the teacher make it so the child doesn't have access just to the EBSCO database? So the, the parent actually or the teacher actually having an on-off button for a particular student, is that what you're trying no, to No, more, more that these children, I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to get at, could, could a child not have access to the EBSCO database but other online resources or would a parent have to say, you don't have my ch I don't want my child to use any online resources? So yeah, let, we'll me, let, them, let me let me put this back um, 
to, to you guys. That was a question that we've been asking as a board as well, and so as a UETN board. Okay. So, so, so this, so EBSCO Elementary, Middle, and High School links are on the same website that has World Book, um, Utah newspapers, a, a variety of electronic library materials. And a parent, I guess it depends on if you're asking about an electronic solution or an educator-led well, solution. So, combo. Um, so if the student has the username and password or they're in one of our schools and they click on Utah's online library page, they would have the links all available to them. Oh. Not currently, but um, yes. It, no, you couldn't, it can't, there's not an on-off switch for there a certain not. database. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Uh, Superintendent Dixon. This is maybe attached to what Board Member Lear was um, asking, but just for clarification, so you, UETN at any time, let's say you have a, within the EBSCO contract, you can say we want these elements eliminated from EBSCO. We want the following magazine subscriptions eliminated. You, you can pick and choose within EBSCO, can you not, to determine what you will subscribe to or not? That's exactly what happened in this situation. A, a parent found something. It wasn't age appropriate. We immediately requested that that particular journal and article be removed from the K-12 instance. Uh, we complained a lot and uh, got frustrated with them. and ask them to go back and completely review everything that we subscribe to from them. Um, at that point, the, the list of journals from the parents in Colorado was made available. We asked them to implement blocking those same journals. And it's journals or publications that, um, as you said in your notes, are typically marketed to adults and really not appropriate for a K-12 setting. Um, so those, that has been implemented. Um, in addition, they also implemented more robust filtering, and, and this goes to a point, Board Member Ellis, that you were saying. There's filtering at the level of the databases, and then there's filtering at the level of the school or the home or the device. So at the level of the databases, the mm -hmm. vendor also implemented more robust filtering. I requested that that's the most conservative filtering that's available and that if we make a complaint, yes, they can immediately um, fix something. Or if they hear from their other K-12 customers across the country, if they're aware of a situation, that we expect them to alert us and to stay on top of that as well. Okay, there's about five other board members, six including me, but I'll go last. <laughs> so um, if, we, if you guys stay lasered on your questions or comments, that would be great. Um, board member Lisa Cummins. I think we've just asked the fox to guard the hen house. We've EBSCO has known about this. They've they've been approached by this before. I'm wondering. I I watched the meeting of October first. I'm wondering who is responsible for oversight of of EBSCO and monitoring what is put on this on this on this site. Because if it's not EBSCO monitoring themselves, who's monitoring on our end? And I would say there's multiple layers to that. So we, we are a service provider to, to you all and to the schools. There's nothing that requires them to use that service. So the service that we provide is a contract with EBSCO. Um, we have expectations on them as a vendor. Um, and, and everything through the individual user sitting at their their Chromebook or their own device. So it's the student's responsibility to monitor what they can and cannot see, and you have no, and you kind of wash your hands of it, no responsibility whatsoever. Yeah, I don't think that's what I said. What I said is you asked where the responsibility lies, right. and I said it's at all of those layers. We are, we are all responsible. From the student, but you, educator, but parent, we've already established. We, but we've already established that UTN is separate from the Utah State's Board of Education. That we really have no oversight or or anything, and that you're a separate entity. So, I wouldn't have known about that. I know that parents outside wouldn't have known about that, and I certainly know that students don't know about that. So again, who at UTEN is responsible for allowing this kind of data to get through to our students at the K-12 level? I, I don't know. I don't know that. if that's really a fair question. It we is shouldn't a fair be question. Well, I don't think we should put these guys on. They don't work for us. 
<laughs> However, they work for the state and they've got a contract with us. And I, I think it'd be, because we're going to, we're not going to get anything really accomplished um, having, and, and it's a But good, our children it, are, have been at risk okay. and they're exposing and, uh, maybe and I can, now that there's maybe serious I can problems with our children. Maybe I your question to um, um, uh, Dr. Timothy. There's, there, there, there's already, there are processes in place and, and this particular situation, when you're dealing with IT and intelligence and everything out there and there's filters, there's a couple different environments. There's the reactive environment and being proactive. You find something, this is what you do. Then on the proactive side, and maybe you can enlighten our board on your re what would you do within um, UETN on being the proactive side to make sure or to have some kind of assurances that these filters and the vendors and every everyone that could be a vendor, I guess, um, uh, has things in place to minimize or, or do everything probably possible or close to possible to not have these incidences happen. Can you describe to the board, and I'm going to get to, this will probably answer your question. Do you have people, what do you do on your side um, that uh, monitors and or participates in that oversight for that protection? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for that question. Uh, if you need someone to blame, I'm the CEO of UETN. Ray Timothy is my name. So, I mean, I, I take full responsibility if I need, if that's what you need. Uh, I, I just want you to know I've, I've been uh, the CEO at UETN for six years now. And in six years, there have been two instances that have come to my level. This is one of them. Uh, one happened about two years ago. And that problem was the fact that younger students were accessing material that was not age appropriate. And the minute that we found out about it, we immediately began working with, with EBSCO. And that's when we divided the access and content into the, uh, into the K-12 uh, higher ed and then the academic libraries. So uh, I have an instructional support uh, team. Uh, that's what Dr. Hunter uh, is over. They, they work with the contracts. Any complaints that come our direction are, are addressed by her staff. Uh, we watch that very carefully. Uh, when, when you look at the number of, of students, the number of teachers that, that use uh, this product uh, in an academic environment, uh, two instances are too, too many. I agree with you on that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, I believe that uh, we've done a, a, a pretty good job of making sure that, that we look out for the best interests of our students. None of us want our students exposed to, to that type of material. We want to make sure that, that they're not uh, being inundated with that. So. I know you're trying. To, I know you're trying to go, but I want to allow want to board, um, board member Lisa Cummins to. I was trying to get to that point of accountability in that without Thank you. trying to find out employees' names and or something else. And so, I appreciate you handling that particular accountability piece. So I appreciate you stepping forward with that. My concern is this isn't just one issue. This is eleven thousand sites being accessed. This is different words being accessed. This is children being addicted and causing harm within the family because now that now there's an addiction that needs to be fought. This is a mental illness, an epidemic that we've already, uh, this isn't just one issue. This is a major problem. This goes on to have sex offenders. This goes on to have depression and suicide and a whole bunch of other things and so this isn't just one issue and if we're if we're relying on EBSCO to to clean up their their database again even after Colorado even still being on the dirty dozen and still we're still going to go say okay we're, we're going to go back to them because now we trust them I don't think Utah parents trust that at all at all. Okay. Um, I know Vice Chair Ellis is going to be hitting the road real quick, so I'm going to 
It's easier to listen to you here than... It is. I will be on the phone, but I'd rather make these statements here in person than that. But if we do a vote, I'll be on the phone. Spencer, you're on deck, by the way. Um, so first of all, this isn't in... I'm not really addressing you, but we've been receiving a lot of emails, and uh, there's a comment made by one of the UETN board members uh, basically accusing... Uh, everyone of censoring material if we were to shut down the K-12 access to EBSCO. And um, I just have some thoughts on that that I'd, I'd like to share. Um, and I, you know, I don't believe that this is a violation of a First Amendment right to fil filter EBSCO's database because we're using taxpayer dollars and we're not burning the material. It's still accessible outside. We're just not placing it in front of the students. And a database, by its very nature, exists to limit the amount of information placed in front of our kids or citizens. Database administrators work as self-appointed judge and jury, um, so this would go to EBSCO, as, what is, as to what is credible and should exist inside that database. In the case of EBSCO, they then charge educational and public institutions money to have access to their self-filtered data. If I look up Apple on Google, just the term Apple, I get over two billion results. If I looked up, I looked up ABSCO, uh, sorry, Apple today on um, EBSCO's high school database and there was 278,000, results. That was through the public library site. Um, they've limited 99.99% of the Apple content that a child can find. And so proponents that are, re that are saying that we need EBSCO um, because we're limiting uh, someone's First Amendment right, I cry foul on that because by the very nature that we are self-filtering and we're then selecting pornography as defined by Utah State Code to be put into this um, database. And there was an email today uh, equating us to, uh, to Nazis and to book burning. And I just want to say that I find that rather hypocritical that a database by its very nature is self-selecting what materials should be put in front of a kid. Even when you're talking about Gail's resource and saying, you know, that we're looking at a topic and we're saying we're going to pick which content they can see for and against a certain topic, that by its very nature is deciding what is appropriate for someone to see. And so I find it very, um, no, I find it very um, reasonable that we should be able to put appropriate, age-appropriate content. Um, in Utah state law, it says that a content provider, and I, was, I believe that UETN would be considered the, uh, the content provider by this code, and so as soon as our Attorney General is back, I'd like to him to look at this definition. But a content provider shall restrict access to material harmful to minors. That is defined in code if you go to this section of code, 76-10-1201. Harmful to minors is defined very clearly in the code, and then pornography is defined very clearly in section 1203. And then you jump to section 1227, and it defines what is illicit material. Um, and it says it has to have serious value for minors. And if you go to that section of code, it lists very clearly what is not considered serious value to minors. And there's also another section of code that says very clearly that we have to restrict access in all public areas to minors of anything that violates these terms in this section of law. So we can stop playing the he said, she said, and this and that. We have it defined in law, and I would urge you to please look at it because as I see it right now, we are knowingly violating this section of code and its violation of a third degree felony by still having the public library site and this material accessible to minors. So please do your due diligence and make sure that we are following every single letter of the law. Thank you. Okay. Um, Board Member Stokes. So I. I think it was a really good question that was asked at the beginning of this, and I, I, um, I love spending time with all of you, don't get me wrong, but we don't have any control over this. Uh, we have a vote. Um, this is done by the Utah State Legislature. It's, I think, a direct appropriation to UETN, right? Yes. doesn't come through us. And nor do I think that we even probably sign, do we sign a contract with you guys? Do we, does the State Board of Education sign a contract for us to be? So it's directly to the legislature, from the legislature to you guys. 
in my mind, that's the policy body you ought to be dealing with and not us. Um, and this is the, we, you know, we can argue all day long about <laughs> whether or not because I know both of you really want our students to be, have access to pornography. I can see it in your faces. <laughs> and, um, and I'm sure that the EBSCO people are sitting back there going, how can we pump pornography into Utah schools? The fact of the matter is this kind of just snuck through. And, and we, have, we have problems like this that happen. Nobody wants children exposed to pornography. I don't care. I mean, unless you're running a, you know, a... Um, you know, online child sex slavery uh, website. I don't think anybody wants that. So my point is we started, we started getting emails from legislators who don't understand that they actually have a role, that, that they're, they're the fiduciary responsible people, not us on this. So if I were to say there's any any act that is is bad it's that the legislature doesn't know they're in charge of you and they were trying to ask us to get involved um, with it because they don't understand that they're in charge of it um, and this is a common this happens like 150 times a week that we either get blamed for something that's happening in education that we have no control over or we're getting uh, want, being asked to regulate something that we have no control over. So, um, you know, my, my, my attitude is you guys ought to continue to do your job. You're the, you're the primary access to it. If we don't want schools to have any access to any of this, then we ought to, we ought to vote and say to the legislature, we don't want UETN to be provided to Utah's schools. And I think they would look at us and go, well, we got tough. That's, what, that's what's going to happen. So I don't think we have any actionable um, item here. Patty's on, the, Patty's on one of the voting members. How many other voting members are there, Patty? There's 13. I, 13 voting members. Uh, could you just out of, I know I think you talked about the 13 members, but you didn't list them all. Could you list them all? Do you have it pulled up on? What the web, the website? Well, she's bringing this up real quick. We we still have like five or six board member comments, and really the but, purpose of purpose of we don't have a motion. Well, why I, I can't speak to why the board why board members want to push their light, uh, superintendent. But why is this even on our agenda? Well, because we have one person that repre that works for us that has a seat there that wants direction and from us going into this meeting on I believe it's the 19th so I'm going to go back to the purpose of the meeting and there isn't a motion by the way so let's just let's just talk we we should have them I'm not saying we're I'm not calling for one right now but we gotta remember why we're here and what we're here talk to talk about we have we have a voice we have one we have a voice and a seat showing up at UE, UETN on the 19th what do we want? Do we have any direction that we want to send um, with our vote? Um, I mean, we can we can beat you up, doc, both doctors, all all day. But we, you know your mission and purpose, and and that, and you're, you're probably some good advice and some good things that are coming your way. But I believe you probably already knew most of this uh, coming into here because you're really bright and understand and from the, what happened in the last board meeting and everything that's happened since. So we're back to, well, this is coming up. Maybe it's up. Yeah. What are we going to have our representative, um, do in this board meeting or in this up and coming board meeting? That is, that's why we're really here, not to put the whole system on yeah. trial, but so super, um, Spencer, do you have a, did something come up for you to see or did you find it? Okay. Did you have a follow up? Yeah, I moved. Hold that. You're on. I would move that we ask Patty Norman to make to to request during the board meeting that they take the necessary uh, uh, steps to protect our ch the children of Utah and the, and to vote to turn this back on. Okay, we have a motion. 
Do we have a second? Second discussion. So everyone that's got their lights on, we're discussing to this motion starting off with Board Member Reby. It's off. Uh, we have uh, Board Member Belknap. Do you have any discussion to this particular motion? Um, yeah, an amendment, please. Okay. And I'd like to make, oh, hold on, hold on. I'd like to make an amendment that we move to temporarily have a, the appoint Superintendent Sidney Dixon to represent us at that October meeting and not Patty Norman. I would like to split that. Yeah, I, yeah. So just, just change, oh. Patty. That's in addition to. So you're adding that. To so that's an that's an amendment, I'll correct? Second that amendment. Thank you. Okay, we have an amendment to Spencer's motion. Is Chair, there a second? Like to... And we have a second. We're going to speak to the amendment. To the motion, um, Chair, board member Wright, are you going to speak to the amendment to the motion? Okay, thank you. There's not a lot to say, but let's get with it. Okay, for sure, is are people speaking truly speaking to the amendment? Okay, I, I support Dr. Dixon in being able to speak for okay. the board. At what, the, at the all right. Meeting. Well, you can support by voting too, but. <laughs> Okay, Board Member Hansen. Do they allow proxy voting? That's my other question. Can we vote by, can we switch people around? We have the authority to do that. That was just my question. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to restate the amendment to the motion. The amendment was to have Dr. Dixon. I had to come back. You couldn't hear me. <laughs> we just don't get enough of you. Um, so we'll hear up here and in here. So um, the amendment is to have Dr. Dixon represent um, Superintendent, Deputy Superintendent Patty Norman in the 19th meeting. So not seeing any further. I would like to split the motion. Lisa wants to split the motion. Okay, well, you can get there anyway. You're still going to have the same number of votes, so I don't know. The, we can split the motion. Okay, we're going to split this motion. We're going to do the doc. No, we're going to do the easy part first. Okay, and that is uh, the, the, the motion is that uh, Dr. Dixon represents State Board of Education. Uh, and the substitute for Deputy Superintendent Patty Norman in the, the, the October meeting. I don't want to lock in a date because it might, it might move it up. Who knows what will happen. Okay, that's a motion before the group. Not seeing any discussion to that motion. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay, voting was unanimous. Um, really good. We had really good speaking to that motion okay um, now we're on to Spencer's motion which is will you repeat it exactly I, okay help me turn this back on okay Miss Lorraine's gonna repeat that motion okay the motion is to ask the board's representative to the UEN board to request that UEN take the necessary steps to protect Utah students and request that EBSCO be turned back on okay. is that the right way to say it <laughs> <clears throat> yes, that was a motion, and, and uh, Spencer, were you able to speak to your motion? Well, I'd like to. Okay, I figured you would. Um, let's let's be very clear that every library in this state uses this service, correct? Mm -hmm. And um, so you can they can go to the they can go to the library in their county or in their neighborhood, or they can be in their schools to access this, right? So, and we're taking a motion to protect them from have it, seeing it in schools, but they can go after school, their library, and research there. Yeah, this is, all, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So do you have anything more to say to your motion, Spencer? 
Hold it. Let me get you. I back. would encourage board members to vote for the motion and understand that that we can protect our children, and they're going to take every effort to do that to protect the children. But that kids get exposed to this kind of stuff. I mean, I was a kid when I was growing up, and I I got exposed to it in my library. I, as a matter of fact, I read the book "The Day No More Pigs Would Die," and it had "The Day No Pigs Would Die," and it had something in it that my mother thought was terrible. Um, and she marched into school and said, I don't, want my, I don't want my son writing a book report. Now, I came across that passage three weeks before the assignment was due and knew this would be a hot-button topic for my mother. So I went right to my mother the day before the, the, the report was due <laughs> and showed her this because I didn't have the report done. And she marched right in there and threw a, real, a fit. And guess what? I didn't have to write the report. <laughs> And uh, I knew it. I knew that's what was going to happen. So we get, it, we get exposed to this kind of stuff. Um, I get it, but we ought to, we ought to teach our, our children as well that they should go and report this. Um, and we, they should be helpers in, in keeping this off of the site. So I, we're never going to be able to 100% control, control this. But I believe that UT, UETN, did I get it right? is doing a great job. They have been doing a great job. They've, as Ray said, one, one time in your, how many years you've been there? Six. Six. So let's continue to have a vote of confidence in them, turn this back on so our students can research and continue to have a world-class education in Utah. Okay, we're, gonna, we're speaking to the motion. Um, Board Member Lisa Cummins. So I'm going to cite two um, federal cases that came before the Supreme Court. Uh, one was in 1968, Ginsburg versus New York. As the Supreme Court explained, government has a responsibility to protect children's welfare, and what's obscene for kids isn't necessarily the same as what's obscene for adults. In the case United States versus American Library Association Incorporated, uh, 2003. Based on the principle of harm to kids, the Supreme Court also upheld a federal law that requires public and school libraries to use internet filtering software to block pornographic images as con condition for receiving federal funds. As some of the justices pointed out, the law didn't violate the free speech of rights of adult porns at public libraries because it allowed librarians to give adults unblocked access to computers on request. We have got to protect our children first. Okay. Um, Board member Wright, will you turn your back on? And then it's uh, Vice Chair Brittany Cummins. And then three more after that. Did you have something? Oh, it's yeah. my turn. Okay, fine. Yeah. I just, you know, a, a year and a half ago, a friend showed me how to do Google Safe Search. And so I've since done that on my devices. And now, in the past, when I do things that I didn't think were, you know, sexy searches, um, you know, bad stuff would come up. Now, even when I put in aggressive stuff, I've tested it that should bring up bad stuff, it doesn't. Google Safe Search seems to be working. So I just feel like there are clever things out there that have become very good at blocking this, forms of artificial intelligence that can see this. And also, most social media have something where you can flag something and report it. And it seems like if anything is bad, you should be able to report it. And once you get one or two people reporting it, some live person should be there going and checking it, saying, yep, gone, yep, gone. In fact, I mean, if anything gets more than two or three flags, it's just it's taken down until it's approved again. I mean, I hate to say it, but China and Iran are really good at this. I mean, you know, and I just can't believe that we can't get that, that, that good at this. And, and so I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going to be opposed to this motion until you guys give me more confidence. This is so pathetic, what's happened. I'm sorry. You are responsible. You should have been more on top of this. And I'm not impressed. Vice Chair Brittany Cummins. Um, I just 
I'm in favor of the motion and want to speak for it. Um, I think we're, there's been a little bit of confusion between what is a web browser and what is a, uh, a database and a, a search tool because this, this EBSCO provides access to things you can't access on a web browser because it's subscription only uh, for uh, peer-reviewed articles in periodicals that we can't access just through the web. And, but I, I'm grateful for the motion that was made because it, it goes to the trust that we have that, that these things have come to our attention, to everyone's attention, right? And we know that there are ways that, that through this database certain periodicals can be blocked or taken off of certain age groups. And so there's processes and there's things. And, and we have the opportunity now to fix that problem, to move forward, and, and then to provide access to these periodicals that are available for educational purposes. So I speak in favor of the motion. Board Member Lear, then Board Member Hanson, you're on deck. I'm going to go back to what I've heard often among board members, and that is that individual parents are primarily respons responsible for their children's education. And I think if individual parents don't want their children to have access to these, to the broader range of, of materials or um, information, that they have a very clear opportunity to, to, um, to make it so that their children don't have access to this, but it allows other children and other parents that same right. So I also support the motion, and I would um, perhaps make a, make a recommendation, I don't want to make it a motion, but that our office remind individual parents that they absolutely have the right to request that their children not have access to, to electronic databases so that the parents can speak for their children in individual cases. So I very much support the motion. Yeah. Thank you. Board, mem board member Hansen and then board member Warner. Um, this is a very hard one for me because I, I have used this database extensively, but I don't think we can ignore those images that we saw. Uh, our kids should not have access to that. They should, they should not have access to that. And um, so you're pure, Spencer, so you're good. But I... Um, I, I'm, I'm very, very concerned, and I don't believe we should turn this on until we make sure the filtering is in place that we need. My filtering at home is better than this, and that's ridiculous. I mean, these are our schools, and there is a difference between a, a student going to a public library and accessing this and a student accessing them at school just because, as a parent, I expect that that... Uh, what has been done at school is safe for my kids. I expect that whatever has been needs to be put in place has been put in place and that, that they have um, safety when they're going to those databases and, and it hasn't been safe for them and, and I feel very badly about that. Okay. Um, board member uh, Warner and then board member Bolter, you're on deck. I, I have a question before a comment. So I was talking to board member um, Ellis, and she pointed out that she had gone on. I want you to know I did try, <laughs> but I don't have a password apparently or a username. So I'm used to seeing this stuff at work. We as the victim advocates have to review stuff so the attorneys don't have to. And, uh, and so I couldn't find anything. And I was telling board member Ellis I, I didn't find anything, but apparently I don't have a sign in. But she said that she checked with both of, and, and I told her I was going to bring this up, so she was okay with it. She said she checked both her, with a high school login and then with a college login through BYU. And she found that the college login with BYU has an academic parameter, whereas the K-12 does not. So when she tried to find specific words, uh, and I won't bring up what she and I discussed with, with looking up, but she looked up specific things. It, she couldn't find it through the BYU academic parameters. I'm wondering if that's something that 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 same parameter that's used with BYU is that something that can be applied to the K-12 program? Absolutely. I mean, we. So yes, uh, but I would do. I would recommend even beyond that because they're K-12 students that there's even more restrictions than in an academic library. Um, so, so yes, to, to the, all the points that have been discussed. We have been equally disheartened by this and frustrated by the vendor 
And uh, I would say, yes, it could be the same as what BYU has in place, but in addition to other K-12 restrictions. Okay, so that brings me to my second question. How do we ensure that that type of restriction is put into place? At this point, we, we can sit here and talk about it needs to be done. How do we know that by October 22nd or whatever day, 19th. that would be put into place? How do we get that assurance? Uh, so that's exactly what staff and our board asked us to do. So we have a test instance up right now that has all the, the new filters put in place. Right now, only our staff and board members will be accessing that and, and testing it with uh, as much as we can put at it because we want to have that assurance too before anything um, is opened up if it is. And it, it would be up to you, but I think any board members here that want to be able to use that test instance um, would be invited to do that as well. All right. Um, board Member Bolter and then Board Member Reby are on deck. Um, so I'm going to vote no. Um, I'm going to vote against this motion um, for a, a few reasons. The first one is that um, EBSCO is on the dirty dozen list, and they've been on there for a few years now. Um, and then last year, Colorado, and the dirty dozen, this is for child exploitation. Um, and then Colorado last year, 2016-17 school year, brought up issues like this to EBSCO, and they've since moved away from using EBSCO. Um, and then apparently what we're seeing is EBSCO's cleaned up version. And I spent, um, when I was first notified about this um, by a parent, I spent about an hour um, searching different things and I won't say what I searched but some of them were just benign searches like self-esteem but then I got other ideas for things um, and the things that were brought up um, was pornography there was erotica stories um, there were stories glorifying pedophilia stories glorifying um, child trafficking and it was sick I, after about an hour, I just closed my computer and I was physically sick. Um, the other issue is that, and my son knows that I'm, that I'm going to talk about this because this is very open, but my son, who is now 19, but at age 8, he was exposed to pornography through a school computer. He and a group of boys would sit in the back, and it was through UETN. Um, but I don't know if it was EBSCO. I'm guessing it could have been EBSCO, I don't know. I wasn't informed by the school about any of this. Um, and then when we found out about his pornography addiction, he was 15 and a half, and for a year and a half, he had been looking at pornography every night for hours. That's why he wasn't able to stay awake in the morning during the day. His life was turned upside down from pornography. And when we caught him, um, he was on the verge of meeting up with some adults that he had been talking to. And so um, that just started from just simple searches with eight-year-old boys laughing. And his life was turned upside down, and we had to really rebuild his life. And he's one of the lucky ones that have been able to move away from that addiction. But it is a real thing. The state of Utah has declared pornography a... Uh, a crisis, a mental health crisis, or something like that. I can't remember. It's a resolution. And, um, and so I'm not against UE, UETN. It's EBSCO and that, um, that database on there. And these images that were so easily available and that I was easy, that I could find just searching simple things. I mean, and I can tell you afterwards what I searched. I won't say it here because I don't want any child going on there. And it's disturbing to me that it's still available um, in our public libraries. And our children don't even need access or a login to go in there. They can just go to the public li libraries and log in. And that's extremely disturbing. And I believe against state code. I am going to have the AGs look at that. But, um, but I don't know why we're contracting with an entity that 
is on the dirty dozen list for child exploitation, why we would even think they would be of any value to our children in Utah or any state, to tell you the truth. And then um, I've been researching about why pornography was so easily available through the K-12, but it has been harder to find in the college levels. And I was told that it's because the Lexile level, um, because pornography is such an easy reading level, basically, and that's why it's a lot easier to find. And some of the, these searches, it wasn't pages and pages in. It was like the first page, the first few searches um, right there. And so it, it was really disturbing to me, and I felt really sick afterwards, especially after seeing what happened with my son and other boys that, and some of his friends who turned to um, drugs and everything. Like, that rippling effect is really... So I'm voting no um, because I don't ever want any family to face what we faced with our, with our son. Board Member Reby, Reby and then um, Board Member Gravett, your own deck. Uh, I'll be voting in favor of turning it back on. Um, in my school, we have a tool called Land School, and I was wondering how prolific the Land School is in our districts. Do we know that? Because I can see everything every kid types. I can see every key they strike, every search they make, and they can't delete their histories. Uh, I think that this, we, in my schools that I work at, we work really hard to make sure we've educated our kids about the penalties of them using this. But in land school also, we can block sites. So if we feel a kid is abusing a site, we can block that computer from that computer name from going to that site specifically. Um, we have many things in place in our schools, many safeguards. Uh, the district will contact me if there is a site that's been seen and it's flagged by their IP address. So um, I think we need to educate our families and we need to educate our kids what's safe. Board Member Gravett. Um, I too will be Board voting for the motion um, because I want to echo what Board Member Reby said. Um, our students, they, they sign in. Um, they sign an acceptable use policy. We can check their history. They know this. When I do a search on EBSCO with my students, we have parameters. But my question is, was any of this pornography accessed at school? Were any of these examples at school? Do we have a record of it at school or were they all outside of school? The example that was brought to our attention was a parent at their home that was doing a search. So I guess, I, right, but I guess what I find interesting is that, you know, they can still go to libraries, they can do it in other places, but we are preventing it from being in the place that is the safest place for them, in my opinion, where teachers are guiding, directing, or, you know, of course, if the, a parent's doing that as well, but why are we keeping it out of the hands of uh, teachers and schools where I have never seen an instant in 24 years of teaching, but I mean, it hasn't been there. So I'm voting in favor. Board Member Stokes. So I, I would, you know, I've, this is the first time I've heard a lot, about a lot of things. I got a really big education coming to be on the state school board. Um, so I just looked up The Dirty Dozen, and after I got through the movie The Dirty Dozen, <laughs> Uh, it, took, it took me several searches to get to Dirty Dozen, and I finally put in Dirty Dozen EBSCO. Let me read you the other 11, if I could, of the Dirty Dozen. Amazon, Backpage.com, Comcast, EBSCO, HBO, iBooks, Poster Boys, Roku, Snapchat, St Steam, Twitter, and YouTube. If you don't think that all of your kids every day are doing seven or eight of the dirty dozen, you got something coming to you. This, I mean, this is, I'm sorry, but if this is the dirty dozen, then I, I, use, I, use, I use the dirty dozen. I use like 10 of these, like I used them last week. Yeah. Okay, I'm not And I, oh. I would move previous question. Okay, well, I don't see any other comments, so I'm just gonna call this to a vote. Right now, would you restate the motion, Ms. Lorraine, so we had this, and, and I believe it had something to do with, 
um, being in favor if, if there's some ifs attached to it, if our representative feels that certain things have been in place. Okay, let me turn this. Ms. Lorraine, no, the motion before the board is? Okay, the motion is that the board direct the, rep the board's representative to UETN, to the UETN board, to request that UETN take the necessary steps to protect Utah students and request that UETN make EBSCO accessible to schools. I changed that a little bit so it made a little more sense. Does that, rather than just turn it on? Assessed. Is that correct? Can you repeat that one more time, Lorraine. Okay. I said I reworded the and just rather than turning it back on to have it accessible to schools. Is that, if that's not correct, it won't come close. Is that all? The, all right. Okay, I will read that again then. Um, the motion is that the board directs, direct its representative to the UETN board to request that UETN take the necessary steps to protect Utah students and request that UETN make EBSCO accessible to schools. Okay. I think, Lorraine, I said, and, and then after taking those necessary steps, turn it back and, on. Yeah, so okay. it's... Okay, yeah. all right. Yeah, it's, I'll add that to the motion. There's two parts. One is that they do this, and if they're accept, acceptable, then that's a third thing is to turn it back. It's not to turn it on, but make it accessible. So that, so I think it's really clear. It's a three-step process, an expectation to make it safe. If our representative thinks that expectation is met, second part, then vote a certain way to have it turned on. Is that correct, Spencer? Okay. Okay. So do are you going to want to restate that in different, or should we go with that? That's basically that, that's basically it. Okay, so let's vote. Um, all in favor, say aye. aye. Those opposed. No. no. Will, will the ayes raise your hand and be recognized? Okay, we have board member Warner, board member Gravit, board member Lear, um, board member Warner, board member Stokes, board member Reby. Board Member Cummins, Board Member Huntsman. Oh, Brittany Cummins. Oh, let me do. Let me call this again. Sorry. Oh. Okay. Sorry. Board Member Warner. Let me get it. Board Member Warner. Board Member Gravit. Board Member Lear. Board Member Hanson. Board Member Stokes. Board Member Reby. Um, Vice Chair Brittany Cummings and Mark Huntsman. Okay, so the nays, so that they're recognized on this, not abstaining. We have, with well, the nays, I'm going to call them out. Board Member Nielsen, Belknap, Wright, Bolter, um, Board Member Lisa Cummins, and Board Member L uh, Vice Chair Ellis. Okay, um, motion passes. Okay, we're going to go to our committee, our committee reports. Well, actually, we better have a quick break. Seven, yeah, seven minute break. And then, board member Wright, you're first. <laughs> 